So today we're going to be continuing with our IMF section uh, to really start talking about the IMFs. And IMFs basically stands for intermolecular forces. And you're going to notice in a little bit that I will make a differentiation between intermolecular as well as intramolecular. As promised, um, we are starting off by just really differentiating between intramolecular and intermolecular. So you're going to notice a couple things. Um, first of all, of course, is the spelling. Uh, so intramolecular, intra means within. So if you're talking about within and you're talking about within the molecule, uh, then we're talking about the forces that exist uh, and hold atoms together in a molecule. And what we're basically referring to there is uh, bonds. So uh, there's nothing brand new about that. And so that's kind of uh, basically what we're seeing here is that this is unit three. Okay. Um, and then what we're doing right now is going to be uh, introducing the opposite side, which is the intermolecular forces. So this basically means uh, forces that occur between molecules. So uh, for instance, let's say we um, have a molecule that is uh, shaped as such, okay? Um, and it has a negative end and it has positive ends, okay? And there is another molecule um, that is also shaped as such with its negative and its positive ends, um, then what we mean by uh, intermolecular forces is basically that we're going to start to see uh, a connection forming between uh, the positives and the negatives uh, within the substance, okay? Um, and so the uh, intermolecular force is essentially right there. So we're seeing that connection between two different molecules, okay? Um, and then Kind of extending that a little bit, uh, the intermolecular forces are kind of categorized overall by the term uh, van der Waals forces. I don't really expect you to memorize that term, but I do expect you to kind of see it and say, oh yeah, that's IMF, so uh, that relates to all of these. Great visual for when you're looking at this, so you can see um, right here we have HCl or hydrochloric acid and another HCl, um, and this actually is a bond where... The uh, electronegativity difference for chlorine, I believe, is 3.0, and for hydrogen is 2.1. Um, so we actually have a dipole in that direction. Okay, so what that means is that this end has become positive, this end is negative. Positive, oh, positive and negative. Okay. Um, and so what we're really seeing here, and again, sorry, this one has a dipole as well. So what we're seeing here is that right here in the middle is our uh, intramolecular force. This is our covalent bond. This is our uh, bond between chlorine and hydrogen. You can see that based on this difference, a difference of 0 0.9, um, this is a polar covalent bond. Um, and then over here on the right-hand side, this is also, of course, a polar covalent bond. Um, as a result, they have created this situation where we now have an attraction between a negative and a positive. And so this negative chlorine and this positive hydrogen create an intermolecular force. So that is the intermolecular force between two uh, molecules that happen to have created a dipole within them uh, and happen to have polarity as a molecule. So again, this is a polar molecule. Um, and so as a result, we now have a positive and negative end. So, you know, question came up, of course, later, like, why is this extremely relevant? Why does it matter that the molecule is polar? Um, and this is kind of where we're starting to see why does it matter. If the molecule is polar, then it's going to interact with other polar molecules in a special way. It's going to have this kind of positive-negative attraction. So whether it be inter- or intermolecular forces, it's going to take energy in, in order to kind of break them and separate them. Um, if you're overcoming an intramolecular force, what you're really doing is essentially breaking the bond, okay? Uh, and as a result, you're creating new substances. Maybe you're creating elements, maybe you're creating new compounds, but the only way to overcome an intramolecular force is to break an actual bond. So you have a chemical reaction that has to occur. In order to overcome intermolecular forces, now again, keep in mind this is forces that are occurring between molecules that are just near each other. Um, that basically is a phase change. So if I am going to actually get these molecules which are next to each other to spread out in two different directions, essentially I'm going to just heat it and uh, change it from a liquid to a gas or from a solid to a liquid, etc. 
Um, and so as a result, because we, you know, molecular forces are kind of gauged by uh, phase changes, then we measure uh, their strength in order of how they affect melting point, boiling point, and also potentially viscosity. Reminder that melting point is solid to a liquid, boiling point is liquid to a gas. Um, and at, since intermolecular forces are really the forces that hold molecules together as a liquid, a solid, or even as a gas, uh, the stronger they are, then uh, the more energy it's going to take to actually separate them. So if we have really, really strong intermolecular forces, as you might in a solid, um, and then you're going to have to take a lot of energy to actually get it to change into a liquid. Uh, same thing going from a liquid to a gas, going from this situation where the molecules are relatively close together, getting them to a situation where they're not, you're going to have to apply a lot of energy to actually do so. So um, if you have a really, really strong intermolecular force, so you have something that is holding on really, really strong to the things around it, and you try to heat it up or get it to evaporate, um, it's going to be more difficult because it's going to hold on to those things stronger. However, if it's really, really weak, then uh, it's going to be very easy. So it would be a higher boiling or melting point for something that has very strong IMFs. Two other things can affect the, uh, well, two things actually can affect the intermolecular force strength. Um, one of them is going to be the mass. So if I have a really big molecule, um, it's going to be very difficult to get that, that molecule to boil or evaporate. Um, and that should kind of make sense. The heavier a molecule, a molecule is, the more difficult it would actually be to try to get that molecule to evaporate. Um, and so more massive molecules tend to have these stronger IMFs. Um, also, if we have, today um, in class we had these questions about, um, you know, the uh, strength of a polar bond or, or strength in terms of polarity, etc. Um, there are varying degrees. You know, if I have a situation where... Um, I have, you know, uh, electronegativity of 2.1 and 4.0, um, you know, that's a huge difference. That's the difference of 2.9, 1.9, um, and, <laughs> you know, sometimes it's just, things happen fast, uh, versus if I had, you know, 2.1 and 2.5, and that's the difference of 0 0.4. Clearly, uh, this one over here on the right is significantly more polar than this one. And so, uh, the, you know, the one over here on the right would actually have a bigger uh, effect overall on uh, polarity. So if I had molecules that had a polarity of 1.9, you know, that's their bond polarity. So they had a huge difference in polarity, um, or excuse me, a huge difference in electronegativity, then ultimately I would have very, very, very polar molecules and they would attract one another a lot. So increasing polarity does also um, have an effect on the strength of the intermolecular forces. Here's just a quick example looking at uh, the effect of mass on boiling point. So here with mass, if I were to actually calculate this mass, um, which is, you know, not an extremely challenging task, um, I could say carbon plus four hydrogens. You know, roughly uh, each hydrogen is about a mass of one, carbon's about 12, so... Uh, that's about a mass of 16. Oh my gosh, it's right there. Okay, anyways. So it's about a mass of 16. <laughs> um, and then with two carbons and eight hydrogens, that would be about a mass of 30. Uh, and with eight and 12, that would be about a mass, about a mass of 72. Um, and looking at the boiling point, the more massive the molecule gets, and now note this is just carbon and hydrogen. Um, so we're not looking at you know any sort of weird uh, different substance. It's just different combinations of carbon and hydrogen. Um, as the mass increases, the boiling point also increases. Now, the higher the boiling point, that means that you have to reach that temperature to before it starts boiling, which means that the molecules are holding onto each other stronger uh, if it takes more energy to break that intermolecular force. So if I have my molecules and they're holding on really, really strong, um, then that means that the boiling point would end up being very, very high. So just to reiterate, we're talking about intermolecular forces, and these are not as strong as actual bonds, um, but they are connections that occur between molecules, and they are ways that molecules kind of hold on to each other. They're not bonded, they're not holding super strong, but they do have that kind of connection that they are, they're pulling back and forth a little bit. Um, as a group, we refer to them all as van der Waals forces, and there's several different types. These are the three main types of uh, van der Waals or IMFs. Uh, London dispersion forces, these are the weakest. Dipole-dipole interactions, which are kind of in the middle, and then hydrogen bonding, which is the strongest. You 
should be registering something in your brain after I just said that because hydrogen bonding came up in your water packet. The last thing for this section is just kind of recognizing um, where you might find these actual forces. And we're going to do a little bit of practice with, um, you know, just kind of looking at a molecule and identifying, hey, it might have this, it might have that, etc. Um, so, uh, London dispersion forces are actually found in all covalent molecules. And we're going to talk a little bit about in the next section what it means to be a London dispersion force. Um, but basically, uh, it's something that can occur in any covalent molecule if you get the molecules close enough. So, uh, it's found in all covalent molecules. A dipole-dipole, um, it shouldn't surprise you that dipole-dipole is referring, in, uh, of course, to the actual dipole. Um, so, if you have this dipole uh, and that dipole, um, that means that basically uh, the dipole-dipole is, you know, this is negative, this is positive. So, we're going to have an attraction there that's a dipole-dipole force. So if you have this, which is a dipole, and this, which is a dipole, and they come close enough, you can get uh, that. Now, when I say dipole, I'm talking about molecular dipole. So I'm talking about essentially the net dipole. So if I have a molecule that has a net dipole, uh, you know, such as this one, uh, and then I have another molecule that has a net dipole, then the positive and negative ends of those two would connect. Those are going to be found in polar molecules because obviously you have to have um, polarity within that molecule to uh, have that. So you have to have that net dipole. Hydrogen bonding is an extremely polar covalent uh, uh, force that you see in extremely polar covalent molecules. And it has to have uh, hydrogen bonding to either oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine because those are three of the highest uh, on the periodic table with uh, electronegativity because you have to have a huge electronegativity difference. So oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine are the most common that occur uh, with Hydrogen form hydrogen bonding, and oxygen is the one that we usually refer to, okay? Um, I want you to review through these notes. I want you to summarize these notes in a little paragraph, um, and then I want you to write down a couple questions that you still have. When you come into class, um, I'm going to tell you that you can uh, pick up a post-it note, write that question on the post-it note, and stick it on the board, and I'll go through and kind of answer any questions you guys have um, as a result. So again, right now we're just looking at the properties. We're just looking at the basics of what intermolecular forces are. Um, we'll start looking in the next uh, section about um, more specifically what are these forces and what do they mean on the grand scale. Okay. All right. Have a good one.